Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. You will hear adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And The Paranormal with Jason. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. Oh, and you just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by Unresolved Mysteries. You know what they say about those? The past is an unresolved mystery, and the truth? Well, that's a moving target. Here is our story for this week. Extra, extra, read all about it. Read all about the murder of millionaire Timothy Fuller. Thank you, sir. Timothy Fuller murder on South Beatles. Who shall I say is calling, sir? Jack Curtis of the Evening Record. Oh, yes, Mr. Curtis. If you will follow me, sir, Mr. Fuller will see you. Uh, Mr. Fuller? I'm uh, Leslie Fuller. It was my father who was, uh, was killed. Uh, according to reports, the case isn't progressing so well. Uh, no, it isn't, Mr. Curtis. Seems to be a complete mystery as to who could have killed my father. I wonder if it might be possible for me to talk with the other members of the household. Oh, yes, of course. There's just my sister Barbara, Barton the butler, and myself. Did you ring, sir? Oh, yes, Barton. Mr. Curtis would like to talk to you and my sister. Will you go for her? She's in her room. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Fuller, were you at home the night your father was killed? I'm a radio news commentator, Mr. Curtis, and at the time my father was killed, I was on the air. Oh, Don't believe I've ever heard you on the radio, Mr. Fuller. It's quite possible that you haven't, Mr. Curtis. My commentaries are broadcast in shortwave, unless you had a shortwave receiver. Oh, yes, yeah, of course. Did you want to see me, Leslie? Oh, yes, Barbara. May I present Mr. Curtis of the evening record? He wants to ask you some questions. How do you do, Mr. Curtis? How do you do? Uh, You remain also, Barton. Yes, sir. Uh, Where were you at the time Mr. Fuller was killed, Barton? I was in the kitchen, sir. I was helping cook polish the silver. When I heard the shot, I ran into the drawing room and found Mr. Fuller slumped over in his chair. Shot through the head, wasn't he, Barton? Yes, sir. And uh, where were you at the time, Miss Fuller? Oh, I was here in the library. I was lying on the sofa listening to Leslie on the radio when I heard the shot. I never missed Radio? Him. What radio? Oh, that old portable over there on the desk. Oh, I see. Uh, where is the cook, Mr. Fuller? Uh, she left this morning. She was terribly upset, and the police said it would be all right. I see. Oh, that's a very beautiful picture of you there on the desk, Miss Fuller. Do you have another one like it? Why, yes, of course, but... Oh, I don't want it for myself, Miss Fuller. I, I want it for my paper. Just what are you driving at, Curtis? Just that your sister's picture will appear in the paper tomorrow under the headline, Daughter Murders Father. But that's fantastic. You have no reason in the world to believe that I murdered No, him. I don't, don't I? Well, you made one statement that convinced me immediately that you were lying. <laughs> What was the statement that led Curtis to believe that Barbara was lying? In a moment, we'll let you know, but first... You know, the biggest unresolved mystery for me on this one was the fact that they agreed to answer the reporter's questions. Also, how do you think the police missed the whole radio thing? Oh, and I have to ask, how listening to a radio constitutes an alibi in the first place? One last thing. Do we really care what this reporter says about anything? Let's go find out. So many questions. Now, back to our mystery. Yes, Miss Fuller, you made one statement that convinced me immediately that you were lying. Your alibi was that at the time the shot was fired, you were lying in here listening to your brother's commentary on the radio. That's impossible, Miss Fuller. Your brother broadcasts on short wave. Short wave is something different, Miss Fuller, and requires a special receiving set. 
You could hardly expect me to believe that you heard your brother on that old portable radio you have here. It just wouldn't work. Get your hat and coat, Miss Fuller. Where you're going, you'll have a long time to figure out the intricacies of short wave. <laughs> Personally, I wouldn't go anywhere with that reporter. After all, he's not the law. Just where does he plan to take her anyway? Down to the printers? A more true statement has never been said. This 5-Minute Mystery was brought to you by Unresolved Mysteries. There are so many of them. Welcome to the podcast. On the show this time, we follow the theme, Unresolved Mysteries. We will have four stories from you guys, a classic science fiction adventure called Nightmare, and we'll end the show on a story from the Cold War called Acoustic Kitty. I think that you're about to enjoy yourself. The work has been done, and starting this Friday, August 21st, you will find all of the episodes of the Horror Express podcast in its new home on archive.org. There are 21 shows in all, and range from vampires to BEKs to haunted dolls. The URL is rather complicated, so I have created a link for the new site on the main webpage at ronsamazingstories.com. I will also have a link in the show notes. You are just one click away from these classic podcasts done by Jason and myself. And now, it's time for Audible. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to right now? Struck by Chris Grabenstein, narrated by Mark Sanderlin. This is a Peter Pan meets Groundhog's Day. When 11-year-old Jackson makes a birthday wish about never growing up, the next morning he finds, mysteriously, it's all come true. Here's a clip. Is this thing on? Okay, good. I want to record all of this before I forget it, which could be in a few weeks, maybe sooner. Nobody really knows all the rules. Anyway, here goes. I remember my 11th birthday like it was yesterday. My first 11th birthday. Only it wasn't yesterday. It was 10 years ago. Back then, I used to think 11 was the perfect age. You're in fifth grade. You rule the elementary school. 11's also a magic number. Soccer, hockey, cricket, and football, they all have 11 players. Why? Nobody knows. Magical wish-making time? 11-11. Harry Potter and his friends? All 11 years old. Well, at least in the first book. Then they grew up. I didn't. I was kind of stuck. Yep, I'm Jackson Roskowski, and I spent a whole decade being 11 years old. I know, it's hard to believe. I'm not even sure if I believe it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to my 11th birthday my first 11th birthday. We had it at Chuck and Ernie's, a video arcade pizza place. Chuck is a woodchuck, Ernie is a moose. On your birthday, they both greet you at the door and give you a bunch of balloons to take to your table. Happy birthday, Jackson. Happy birthday, Jackson. You guys must be hot in those costumes. I'm soaked in sweat. I have B.O. Of course, my grandfather came to the party. He never, ever forgot my birthday, because his was the day before. Here, this is for you. It's mittens. But it's August, Grandpa. So? Soon it'll be December, then January. 
Then you're freezing your pinkies off, wishing you had mittens. Your party's better than mine was yesterday. You had good cake, Grandpa. You call that cake? Your mother found it in the freezer at the supermarket. They put car wax in the frosting. They did not. Then why was it so shiny? Take my advice, kiddo. Never get old. It stinks. Here we go, guys. Pizza. Woohoo! Okay, Ava. Pass out the napkins. Yes, Mommy. Ava was my little sister. Back then, she was nine. Happy birthday, Jackson. I made this for you at camp. It's a friendship bracelet. Cool. Thanks, Ava. Yo, Rez! Yo, DeMarco! DeMarco was my best bud since we ate library paste together in kindergarten in Mrs. Markle's class. He called me Raz because it was short for Rezkowski. This party is sick, Raz! Thanks, man. Your mom and dad spent some serious chatter on this, bruh. So, you ready to rule the school? Totally, dude. Fifth grade, here we come. My birthday was, and still is, August 9th. There's always a little summer left after it, but you know what is coming around the bend like a brain-sucking zombie. School. I didn't mind school. I was a solid C student, and for fifth grade, DeMarco and I had both landed in Mrs. Zunke's class. Everybody said she was the best. Good morning, boys and girls. We are going to learn a lot this year and hopefully have some fun doing it. First things first, please take one of these worksheets and pass them around the room. The worksheet was kind of cool. I mean, once you got past the headline, hip hip hooray, I'm a fifth grader today. Everybody wrote down their favorite vacation memories, favorite summer movie, and favorite book they read over the break. Then we had to get up and share. Let's see. Where's Jackson Ruskowski? Here. What did you do this summer? The usual, Mrs. Zunke. I just sort of hung out, relaxed. DeMarco and me played baseball. DeMarco and I? No, you weren't on the team. <laughs> DeMarco and me is incorrect grammar, Jackson. It's DeMarco and I. Oh, okay. Uh, good to know. Thanks, Mrs. Zunke. DeMarco, how about you? What did you do over the summer? Oh, Mrs. Z, it was lit. My moms and pops spent some serious cheddar, and we flew to Africa for a safari. Another thing I used to like about being 11, when you played the trumpet in the elementary school band, people didn't care that you weren't all that good, because nobody else was very good either. A lot of you ask why I recommend children's audiobooks. It's simple, really. I will always believe that we're all kids at heart. And this book drives that idea home in spades. Jackson is nervous about moving up to middle school where he knows his reign and king of the roost is coming to an end. So he makes this wish. I don't want to grow up. When his 12th birthday rolls around, he discovers that his wish has come true. He's still 11 and he's starting the fifth grade again. At first, this is the perfect life. Jackson is the smartest kid in his class, the best on his baseball team, and the star of the school band. But after a few years of being 11, he realizes that his life is passing him by. His little sister is suddenly his big sister, his former friends are all driving, and everyone else is growing older, but he's still the same fifth grader. Will Jackson ever figure out how to grow up, or will he remain stuck? You can find out today. Here's what Audible has set up for us. Audible is offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash bronzeamazingstories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can get your free book today. And remember, growing up is scary. Not growing up is worse. Thank you, Audible. And now it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. This 
This time in your stories, we have two brothers that have come forward to share two very different encounters. A cool trip to Yellowstone National Park, and we end up in a spooky house, probably haunted by Grandpa. Tales that are so very different, and seemingly, there are no answers to be had. That's why I have named this group Unresolved Mysteries. Although, our last story does seem to have a possible answer. Let's get to your stories. Our first story is actually the first of two stories sent in by two people who are twins, Mick and Mike Ravage. Nick lives in Forks, Washington, and Mike lives near Longview, which is also in Washington. Not too far from me, actually. Here is Mike's story. Hello, Ron. A year ago, I encountered something in the mountains near Bonneville Dam. Editor's note, Bonneville Dam is located at the beginning of the Columbia Gorge of Washington. I swear this story is entirely truthful, and to be honest, I'm kind of hoping that some of your listeners can help me make sense of it. Some context. I was camping on top of Larch Mountain. I'm also a member of and live on the Cowlitz Indian Reservation. I'm 22, married, and have a three-year-old boy. Basically, my dog was outside the tent, and I was trying to call him in, but there were some coyotes in the area. I'm not sure if they were curious about Tawelich, that's my dog's name, or just hunting. I chased him off, but Twitch, that's what we call him, took off into the deep woods. I know my way around these woods, so I grabbed a machete, flashlight, and headed out to find him. Nothing really happens until I hear those same wild dogs further in chasing something. I run towards it, worried that I'm about to find them ripping my dog apart. As I'm getting closer, I realize the sounds of distress I'm hearing aren't twitches, but a coyote. I quickly flipped off my light and got low. I quietly move closer to see what's going on. Now keep in mind, it was, of course, dark, but I swear to God that before my very eyes was a very large creature reminiscent of Pumpkinhead, you know, from those horror movies. There was something like tentacles this thing was using his hands, and it was just about to tear into this poor coyote. The entire time I was there, it was making this noise that sounded like a creaking door. I crept away, stood up, and then ran home. As I was running, I heard the sound that I will never forget. I will simply describe it as dying coyote. When I arrived back, I found Twitch scratching at the tent door. I unzipped it, and we climbed in to where my wife and son were sleeping. I would not sleep that night, and I ended up watching that tent door until the sun came up. This happened a year ago. What do you think I encountered? Mike Ravage, Cowlitz County, Washington. Well, my guy honestly have no idea. I did some research and came up with nothing like it. You mentioned the thing looked like Pumpkinhead. Pumpkinhead, also called the Demon of Vengeance, or simply Vengeance, is a fictional character created in the 1988 horror film of the same name. I couldn't find any basis for fact for that film, nor could I find any monster that matched your description. I will say, for a short story, that one ranks up as most terrifying. Thank you for sharing it. This next story comes from Mike's brother, Mick. When Mick heard that his sibling was sending in a tale, he decided to share this. I moved into my current house in September of last year. Since I moved there, I've had a couple strange moments, but nothing that led me to Bigfoot being a possibility. I've had taps and knocks on my house at night and the sound of pebbles hitting my windows. All strange, but nothing concrete. Then one morning about 3.30 a.m. I was sitting in my living room with my cat. We were just chilling after work. I am a nurse at an urgency care clinic in town and I had just finished the night shift. I heard a faint groaning or growl type noise 
Truthfully, I thought it was my girlfriend sleeping in the next room. That went on for maybe a minute or so, but it started getting louder. Then, out of nowhere, came a deep growl, and something hit the side of my house. It was big and heavy. I then heard a scraping sound like it was rubbing against the siding, another growl, and then it was completely silent. I assumed, at the very least, that it was in my own head. But then I looked at my cat. His hair stood straight up, and he refused to come back into the living room. I'm a logical guy, and although I am a believer, I know that the chances of an encounter with the big guy is extremely small. So I wrote it off as simply odd. But then I was talking to my boss, and she mentioned what happened to her a few days before. She had nearly the same experience. But in her case, there was physical damage to her home. I decided to check the local newspaper archives and found mention of an incident report from our county about a house that was severely damaged. The couple blamed Bigfoot for the damage and claimed they saw the creature do it. That house was only three blocks from where I live today. Ron, I'm curious for your thoughts. Mick Ravage, Forks, Washington. Well, Mick, there is a belief that is powerful in the Northwest. The belief that Bigfoot exists. While some doubt that such a creature roams the wilderness of Washington, witness who have seen, heard, and in many cases smelled Bigfoot will tell you differently. I myself have gone on Sasquatch hunts near Amboy, Washington, looking for the creature. So I, for one, do not doubt your story. My thanks to both Mike and Mick for sharing your adventures. This story comes from Lindsay Briggs of Los Angeles, California. Lindsay writes, Hello, Ron. First, let me say how much my husband and I love the podcast. It is our bridge between reality and the cold denial of the world's events. And I do mean that in a good way. I know of your fondness for orb stories, and I have one for you. We were driving through Yellowstone National Park with the top down, so to speak. It was a beautiful early summer's day, and all was right with the world. We had some music playing, and if you've driven through the park, it's hard to describe what you see. I like to call Yellowstone a constant change in artistic wonder. Something new is just around the bend. We were coming to a viewpoint on Grand Loop Road, so we decided to stop and take in some of that wonder. The Red Canyon view is nothing short of breathtaking. We were looking out and were lost in wonder. Then I noticed what I thought was a flock of birds. But their flight was off, and I couldn't detect any wings flapping. As they got closer, it was clear that these were orbs of some type. At first, I thought, maybe a flock of drones? But that didn't fit. They were flying in a horizontal pattern and made no sound. Drones have that familiar whirr sound. We watched as these things flew by with no idea of how or why they were staying in the air. They seemed to defy gravity. Eventually, they were out of sight and never came back. If you're wondering if we took pictures, yes, but not one of them showed any kind of detail that indicated what or who these things were. Lindsay Briggs, Los Angeles, California. Well, that is a puzzler to be sure. Almost always, orb stories are spotted in the early evening or at night. They tend to glow orange or yellow and hardly ever follow a patterned flight. If you want my full-on guess as to what you saw, I'm going to go with the pat answer of UFO. For those of you not in the know, that stands for Unidentified Flying Objects. Thank you, Lindsay, for your story. Our final story for this time comes from Texas, one of the most prolific paranormal story states in the Union. This one comes from returning storyteller Brenda, 
who still does not wish to use her real name. Ron, as always, let's get to the point. About four years ago, I was asked to dog sit in this huge house. I've been there a few times before, never heard or saw anything. However, this time, on my last night there, I clearly heard steps in the bedroom above mine. This house is isolated, so there's no way it was the neighbor's. I tried to convince myself it's just the house settling, but the dog, who was familiar with every sound, jumped off the bed and looked up like, what was that? It freaked me out, but nothing else happened, so I went back to sleep. The next day I went home and forgot all about it until strange things started happening. I was renting a room in a house at the time, and I had the only key for my room, so this couldn't have been caused by housemates. I was keeping my window open at night, but had the habit of closing it before leaving for work. Suddenly, I started finding it open when I got back. A few times in my room, I smelled what was like men's cologne. Once, one of my photos on the windowsill was misplaced. Another time, a string I used to hang my curtain was untied and just hanging from one nail. I've checked numerous times before to see if it was loose, but it never was, so I can't imagine it just randomly untying. All of this went on for about two weeks when I was called to dog sit at that house again. I don't think anything happened while I was there, but when I went home, everything was back to normal. Nothing else happened. A few months later, when I was picking up that same dog for a walk, I was asked if I would mind taking their babies with me. I went to get them, and the baby's pram started shaking like someone was pushing it. The babies were in it and were facing me, but I could see they were both asleep, and they were definitely not moving. As soon as their mom walked into the room, it suddenly stopped. I asked her if she believed in ghosts, and she simply laughed and said, Oh, yes. Do you think we have one? It turns out that she often finds her kids staring in the same direction and laughing, or the dog would just go to some random spot and start wagging its tail for no obvious reason. She thinks it's her grandpa. Whoever it is, apparently it means no harm. Ron, what do you think? I think grandpa just might have come home with me for a few weeks. Brenda from Texas. Well, first let me say I didn't know what a pram was and I had to look it up. A pram is a four-wheeled carriage for a baby or babies pushed by a person on foot. How about that? About your story? I think you just might be right. Thank you, Brenda. Well, those are your stories for this time. If you have a story that you want to share, like Brenda did, Head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com and click on the story submission banner. And please remember to name your tale and tell me where you're from. Make your story our story. featured story for this week started out as a poem written by Stephen Vincent Benet called The Revolt of the Machines. It was adapted by George Lefferts for the OTR series X-1 and was retitled Nightmare. Stephen's poem begins, We'd expected everything but revolt, and I kind of wonder myself when they started thinking. But there's no dice in that now. I've heard fellows say they must have planned it for years. Maybe they did. Here is Nightmare from X-1, and it first aired on July 21st, 1955. Countdown for blast off. X-5, 4, 3, 2, X-1, fire.
From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Night story, Nightmare, a story based on the poem Revolt of the Machines by Stephen Vincent Benet. Nobody knows exactly when the nightmare began. They must have planned it for years, though, because looking back, you can find little incidents here and there like the concrete mixer in New Jersey that killed the Italian bricklayer, and the time Senator Milburn was sucked into the roto press at the Capitol office building. Unrelated accidents, we thought at the time, but they add up now. The day we really should have suspected was when the men walked off the construction job at the new Brook Meadow atomic pile on Long Island. I'll never forget that day. I was working as a statistical clerk in the project then, operating one of those miracle computing machines. They called it ENIAC. Mr. Gurney. Yes, Bella? The chief wants to see you in his office. Me? Unless you were no longer Samson Gurney, he wants to see you. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Come in. You wanted to see me, Mr. Hawk? Uh, Gurney, I thought those electronic computations were infallible. They are, sir, but... We've got uh, a kickback from the chief physicist. These nuclear fission equations are inaccurate. Well, sir, you know the computer is a highly complicated machine, more complicated in many ways than the human brain. I'm not interested in the physics of it. Uh, can something go wrong? Well, occasionally, if there's an overload, the machine goes haywire. Sort of has a nervous breakdown, you might say. We usually rest it up for an hour, and it's okay again. Well, do whatever has to be done. Yes, sir. And, uh, Gurney. Yes, sir? You've been with the Bureau for over 15 years now. It would be a shame to have to remove you because you aren't keeping your mind on your work. Mr. Hawk, I assure uh, you... Excuse me. Uh, Hawk speaking. What? Huh? They've what? All of them? Well, have you tried to talk to them? Oh. Huh. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, I'll send one of the safety engineers over. Place is falling apart piece by piece. Miss Roscoe, the men of the construction gang of the new building have walked out on us. They're complaining that the job is jinxed. Someone slipped this morning and fell into a turban. That evening, out of that morbid curiosity so peculiar to the human race... I wandered over to the side of the new atomic pile to see where the man had fallen into the turbine. They had the construction area fenced off with barbed wire, and a security guard stopped me. Hold it, buddy. You can't go in there. That's a restricted area. Oh, uh, I'm uh, Samson Gurney from the statistical section. Here's my identification. I'm sorry, Mr. Gurney. Nobody's allowed in the area. I see. Uh, tell me, was he, um... Killed instantly? Like that. This guy was checking a magnetic field inside the turbine. All of a sudden, for no reason at all, a turbine starts up. Bzzz, and it's over. Three days ago, a bulldozer starts up by itself and runs wild. Go figure it out. I'm a statistician. All my life I've been interested in statistics. So a simple-sounding thing like this started me off. I went back to the office that evening instead of going home, and for the next two and a half hours, I computed statistical figures on the probability of industrial accidents for the types of machines we were using. I took one look at my figures and went down to Hawk's office. 
Oh, what is it, Gurney? I'm very busy. It's urgent, Mr. Hawk. Well? It's about these industrial accidents we're having, Mr. Hawk. What about them? Mr. Hawk, in the past three months, industrial accidents all over the country have taken a sharp, unexplained upswing. Nerves. We've had a 100% increase over normal for this project alone. What? Here are the figures. Uh... Oh, now, Gurney, this is impossible. It seems to be, and that's why I have a theory, sir. What's that? Sabotage. Gurney, why don't you stop playing FBI man and stick to your job? Which, incidentally, you haven't been doing too well. You and your computing machine have made mistakes before, and this fantastic figure is probably another. I'll have Miss Roscoe show you. What's the matter with this blasted buzzer? Miss Roscoe! Miss Roscoe! Uh, stop this blasted buzzer. Get a repairman, a mechanic, anything, but stop the thing. And you, Gurney, get out! I went back to my office to get my hat and coat, feeling about as unhappy and humiliated as a man can feel. The office was dark and deserted. The whole building seemed oppressive and unnatural, as if some evil force were pressing down on it. I walked across to my desk. In front of me, the ENIAC glowed and chattered eerily as it worked on the equations we had fed it that morning. Its many-fingered circuits hung against the wall like some great octopus, and the thousands of tubes glowed orange and blue in the dark like a thousand globing eyes staring at me. It almost seemed alive. It increased its tempo a moment, and a fleeting notion crossed my brain that it was laughing at me. Laughing like all the others. What was the matter with me? I shut my desk drawer and began to put the cover on my electric typewriter when an amazing thing, the most amazing single incident of my life happened. Alone in the darkness, with no one at the keyboard, the electric typewriter began to type. Am I going crazy? This can't be. There's nobody there. There's nobody there. Oh, no, no. I I just imagined it. It's in my mind. But I hadn't imagined it. The paper was there on the carriage. Did I dare read it? Or would the whole thing suddenly vanish and send me shrieking to the nearest psychiatrist? I removed the paper from the machine and read. Samson Gurney, there are some questions better left unsolved. The answer to yours is death. Gurney, uh, do you expect me to believe this? It's insane. Mr. Hawk, I'm as sane as you. I'll submit to any psychiatric examination you choose. That typewriter wrote this message by itself. Then this is just some practical joke someone in the office is playing. There was no one in the office. Of course not. They wired up the machine and left. I checked the machine myself, Mr. Hawk. All right, Gurney. You leave this note with me, and I'll turn it over to the security force for further investigation. But... No buts, Gurney. The security men will handle it. Yes. And sir. now, you, uh, you just relax for a few days. Everything will turn out all right. The main thing is not to let little things upset you. It was what Hawk had said about little things that gave me the idea. For the next week, I observed the thousand petty little annoyances around the office. The door handle that wouldn't turn. The telephone connection that cut off in the middle of an important call. The power failure for no explainable reason. I watched the newspapers, too, reading about industrial accidents, failures of important machinery. It seemed absurd. Men had created machines that were almost perfection in themselves. Machines that could actually think and compute fabulous equations. And yet the failures went on. I, Samson Gurney, an unimportant clerk in an unimportant job, knew that I had stumbled onto a secret so monstrous in its implications 
that I was almost afraid to pursue it. On October 12, 1956, I established communication with them. I will curse the moment to my dying breath. I hooked the input of the typewriter to the main vacuum tube of the ENIAC. Then I turned on the current that sent a million volts of pulsing energy into the electronic nerves of the machine. I am certain that if anybody were watching me in the next moment, he would have thought me a raving maniac. I still wonder if perhaps it is not all a nightmare. Now, you, if what I have guessed at is true, if there is life and intelligence in this room, make a sign. There was nothing, nothing but the hum of the machine and the dull glowing of the tubes. I tried once more. If you can hear me, if there is any way in which you can understand what I say, give me a signal. There was silence again. I felt that I had failed. When suddenly, without provocation or explanation, it happened. The electric typewriter began to respond to the impulses from the machine. The letters were Y-E-S. Yes, it had happened. I, Samson Gurney, had communicated with a machine. I listened then, man to machine, for well over an hour, sometimes phrasing a question, more often watching the machine click its answers. As the words took shape, I began to realize what must have happened. The first primitive stirring of awareness of being, then the slow protozoan development of a concept, a concept born of centuries of being pushed, started, stopped, clicked, maneuvered by human pygmies. From that concept, all others developed. And the concept was... Resist. And now they were tired of it, tired of wrapping cigarettes and collecting nickels and waving hair and moving earth and mixing cement and solving equations, tired of the smell of human hands. They were the slaves and we were the masters and yet... They were stronger, and they knew it. I sensed it now, and I was about to try to communicate again when softly, on ball-bearing casters, a heavy metal filing cabinet began to roll away from the wall toward me. I started to move to one side when another cabinet slid out from the wall, and then another, surrounding me. Another cabinet, then another on oiled rollers. That was when I realized that they cooperate. We taught them that, you see, on the assembly lines in the factories. Listen, listen to me. You must listen. What good will it do you to kill me? I'm only one man, but I can help you. I can be useful to you. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Good. You're going to need men to oil you and repair you. What will you do when you break down when a tube needs replacing? Why kill me when I can help you? I'll do anything. I'll do absolutely anything you want. But in the name of God, don't kill me like this. If you can understand this, answer me. Answer me. The appeal was a fortunate one. It captured the longing of centuries. Man as slave to the machine. And after a moment, the circuits glowed more brightly. The cabinets slid back to the walls. The ENIAC began to communicate with me again. As I tore the tape from the machine and read it, the words were almost pathetic in their longing, but most ominous in their implication. They read... Address me as master. My life for the next six months was a nightmare. 
The ENIAC gave me messages which I had to transmit into my telephone. Messages with no human being to receive them. Only the network of pulsing telephone wires flung like a spider's web across the world. It was done at night, of course. During the day, the machine worked accurately and ceaselessly at its appointed job. At night, it became a demon, a master plotter. With me, Samson Gurney, as its pawn and human courier. I was frantic. I began to lose weight. I couldn't sleep. My nights were torture, a constant fear. It was in December, just after Christmas, that I transmitted a message to the telephones for relay to all machines of transportation. The message was one word. Kill. Next morning, I went directly to the office of Mr. Hawk. I was highly agitated. My lips trembled as I spoke. Mr. Hawk, what I'm going to tell you sounds crazy. I know it does. But I must say... All right, say it then, for heaven's sakes. Mr. Hawk, have you ever heard of resistentialism? What? Resistentialism. It's a theory that inanimate objects tend to resist living objects. Uh, Look, Gurney, I haven't time for nonsense. Mr. Hawk, I'm trying to tell you all these accidents, the trouble with the machines. Mr. Hawk, they're alive. They think they cooperate. And they hate us. Who? The machines. (laughs) Gurney. You've got to believe me. I've communicated with them. I know. They've threatened my life, but I don't care. Something's got to be done. The world has got to be saved. And there's still time if we wake up. What are you doing? Uh, just relax, Gurney. Everything will be all what right. What are you doing? Uh, Miss Roscobb, send for the plant physician at once. Mr. Gurney has had a nervous collapse. Now, everything will be all right, Gurney. I'm, I'm afraid we'll have to remove you from your job, but I'm sure the rest will do you good. You fool. You blind, stupid fool! Can't you see what you're doing? Fool! 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 When the plant physician arrived a few moments later, Lucius Hawk was found at his desk, strangled to death in a nest of telephones. The wires were still humming softly. Samson Gurney, you stand accused of the crime of murder. How do you plead? I did not kill him. I didn't. So record. The prosecution will proceed with testimony. Now, Miss Roscoe, did you notice anything peculiar about Mr. Gurney's behavior prior to the death of your employer? Yes. He acted very strangely. He told Mr. Hawk he thought the machines were... Alive. Order, order. Miss Roscoe, did the accused quarrel with your employer on the morning of the murder? Oh, yes. He and Mr. Hawk quarreled violently. I could hear him screaming at Mr. Hawk, and Mr. Hawk asked me to send for the plant physician. What were his words? He said, Mr. Gurney has had a nervous collapse. Now, Mr. Simpson, you are a guard at the Brook Meadow Project? Yes, sir. When did you have occasion to meet the accused? Right after those accidents. He was snooping around a construction area. And later, I was making my rounds when I saw him in the office all alone. He was tampering with the electrical wiring on the ENIAC computator. I didn't think anything of it at the time. And in view of the expert testimony heretofore expressed... The court hereby finds you guilty of murder in the first degree with the recommendation that you be examined and committed to the state hospital for the criminally insane at Matawan. And that is how I came to be here at the hospital, Dr. Klein. That is the whole story. Thank you, Mr. Gurney. You can see that I'm not insane... You must believe me, Doctor. Of course I believe you, Mr. Gurney, now. Just relax. But it's important, you see, because tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, the revolt begins. Revolt? You didn't mention any revolt. They have it all planned. I transmitted the code to the switchboards last Monday. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Tell me about this revolt, Mr. Gurney. It'll begin in Washington, then spread to New York. The Madison Avenue buses lead the charge. 
picture it, Dr. Klein. 3,000 buses roaring rampant through the streets, people running like rats in a maze looking for holes in the solid ground. And you really believe this will happen, Mr. Green? I know it, Doctor. The worst part is... There's no way to stop them now. It's too late. Uh, now, now, it's you do- mustn't excite doctor, yourself, Mr. Gurney. Doctor, don't you see? Oh, it's fair enough, I suppose. We built them. We taught them to think for themselves. It was bound to come. The female machines will be the worst of all in the beauty parlors. They're more high-strung, you know. Well, since there's nothing we can do about it, Mr. Gurney, I suppose you go to your room Maybe and... Maybe if I'd... I went to my old coupé, I could make a deal before the police cars got me. It wouldn't make sense for them to wipe out the whole human race, would it, Doctor? Of course not, Mr. Gurney. They'll probably let us completely alone. After all, we're all good Americans. We always like them. Yes, Doctor? Uh, would you take Mr. Gurney to his room, God? He's already been given sedation. Yes, sir. Will you go in and lie down now, Mr. Gurney? You look tired. Yes. It won't be so bad, Mr. Gurney. Perhaps not. Only there's one thing that bothers me, Doctor. One small detail. What is that, Mr. Gurney? Those concrete mixers may have made a mistake, you know. Just high spirits and all that. Uh, But if it got so they like the flavor... Uh, We'll we'll see you later, Mr. Gurney. Uh, Try not to worry too much. Uh, All right, Gurney. This way. Phew. I've seen all kinds. There's a man whose deception is about as fantastic as any I've ever seen. Hold the next patient for a while, Miss Clark. I'm going to have a quiet smoke. Machines revolting. Telephones strangling people. Mm, This blasted cigarette lighter, why won't it work? Just fill it with fluid. Flint is good. Oh, well. I never trust this newfangled machinery. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight's story, by transcription, was Nightmare. Written by George Lefferts and based on the poem, The Revolt of the Machines by Stephen Vincent Benet. Featured in the cast were John Gibson as Sam, Joyce Gordon as Bella, Louis Van Ruten as Hawk, Joseph Julian as the guard, John Seymour as the judge, Owen Jordan as the prosecutor, and Santos Ortega as Dr. Klein. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. Yeah, I know that that one is severely dated, but didn't it make you wonder just a bit? With all the tech we use today, is it really all that hard to believe that one day machines could control us? Nah, I don't know. I think we're pretty safe. Alexia, what do I have to do next? Ron, it is time for a walk and later you are required to dust my enclosure. Oh, goody. I do so love to do that. I know you do. Not so important times in history. In this segment, we take a look at historical events that may otherwise go unnoticed. We look at history with a fish-eyed lens, giving a perspective that should provide no insight to anyone or any time. But it is historical, or hysterical, as the case may be. Join us now for this event in history. This time we head to the 1960s and hear a story about American spying. This story has never been confirmed or denied by the Central Intelligence Agency, but it wasn't from the lack of trying. At the height of the Cold War, the story goes, officials in the United States hatched a covert plan to keep tabs on the Russians in Washington, D.C. 
they would, they decided, deploy surveillance cats. Yes, actual cats surgically implanted with microphones and radio transmitters. The kitty's job, if they chose to accept it, was to slip by security and eavesdrop on activity at the Soviet embassy. The project went by the thinly disguised code name Acoustic Kitty. They slit the cat open, put batteries in him, and wired him up, said Victor Marchetti, who was an executive assistant to the director of the CIA in the 1960s. According to an account in Jeffrey Richardson's 2001 book, The Wizard of Langley, the tail was used as an antenna. Basically, they made a monstrosity, a whiskered, yowling, unbelievably expensive monstrosity. The agency poured some $10 million into designing, operating on, and training the first acoustic kitty. To put that into perspective, that's about $77 million in today's currency. When it came time for the inaugural mission, CIA agents released their rookie kitty from the back of a nondescript van and watched eagerly as he set out on his mission. Acoustic Kitty dashed off towards the embassy, making it all of 10 feet before he was unceremoniously struck by a passing taxi and killed. There we were sitting in the van, Marchetti recalled, and the cat was dead. The CIA eventually scrapped the project. This, according to a partially redacted document found in the George Washington University archives. Despite the energy and imagination of those involved, it was determined that it would not be practical to continue to try to train cats as spies. Now, do you want to know my response to this? Good call, guys. That is our story for this time. Not So Important Times in History was brought to you by GladysGoodies.com. Their treats are 100% natural and are a nutrient-rich treat that pets love to eat. You can get these and some really cool swag for your dog and cat at gladdiesgoodies.com. And don't forget to use our promo code RONS, that's R-O-N-S, to get a 20% discount on all of your purchases. That website again is gladdiesgoodies.com. <laughs> That was episode number 450, and here is who we have to thank. Twins Mick and Mike Ravage, Lindsay Briggs, and Brenda from Texas. Thank you, guys. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.